Warrington plans UN safe havens for Serbs in Croatia. Federal forces keep up round-the-clock assault on Dubrovnik. Britain gives ground on new powers for European Parliament. Father charged with attempted murder of hit-and-run driver. And will the man most likely to beat George Bush enter the race? Good evening. News at 10 tonight has details of a new peace plan which Lord Carrington is expected to offer tomorrow to try to halt Yugoslavia's bloody civil war. The plan would involve the use of a United Nations peacekeeping force, something which both sides, Serbia and Croatia, have indicated they would accept. But it could also mean one of the warring republics, Croatia, having to give up territory to its bitter enemy, Serbia. Lord Carrington, acting for the European community, will put the plan to leaders of both sides in Yugoslavia tomorrow. It would mean setting up safe havens for Serbs inside Croatia. The Yugoslav Federal Army would withdraw, leaving UN forces to police the safe havens. And Serbians living in those areas would then be able to vote on whether to break away from the rest of Croatia. When Lord Carrington came out in September, he said it was his last chance to broker a peace. He doesn't give up. Tomorrow he flies to meet Franjo Tudjman, president of Croatia. In the afternoon he comes to Belgrade to talk to Serbia's president, Slobodan Milosevic, and finally General Velko Kadejevic, the man who's shown he has the power to make war and break the peace as he wishes. He is the hardest nut for Lord Carrington to crack. Because his agreement to withdraw his federal army from all the areas of conflict is critical if this new initiative is to succeed. The purpose of any peace plan is to somehow separate Croat from Serb, to take away from them the opportunity to continue centuries of vendetta. The recent massacre of Croat villages at Cetokovac was proof enough of the hatreds that exist and persists. Each has stories of the other's brutality. It could mean changing the geography as well as the politics of Yugoslavia. The Serbs have already proposed a buffer zone as a prelude to peace. The catch was that it followed exactly the present front line of the war, so that more than a third of Croatia remained in Serbian hands, with the United Nations force trying to keep the peace. It never stood a chance. This new plan might, because nobody redraws the map, at least not yet. The areas in dispute where Serbs live among Croats, and they include Kinin to Karlovac, Osijek, Vukovar, Vinkovci and Abania would be handed to the United Nations for safekeeping, safe havens, the peacekeepers protecting the Serbs from the Croats and the Croats from the Federal Army. All this until a permanent political solution is finally agreed. This, I gather, will be a referendum, and given the historical and ethnic hatreds that exist, almost certainly those parts of Croatia mostly peopled by Serbs will become part of a greater Serbia. So in the long run, the Croatians stand to lose part of their territory, but in return, they get a permanent peace, and with it what they want most of all, universal recognition of their independence. This may well be the offer the Croatians can't afford to refuse. And if the Croatians have any doubts, what is happening in Dubrovnik should remind them how much they are losing every day this war goes on. Today, more federal troops were brought up to the hills overlooking the city and its ancient port. The artillery batteries have also been reinforced, and their pounding on those below is relentless day and night. This is nothing less than the army's massive punishment. This is not a disputed area. No Serbs live here. The only casualties are the Croats. If this new peace initiative fails, if Lord Cannington returns home empty-handed, Dubrovnik, like so much of Croatia, will soon be in ruins as the destruction accelerates. Michael Nicholson, News at 10, Yugoslavia. Croatia claimed tonight that the Yugoslav army was about to launch its final offensive against the rebel republic. The town of Vukovar, near the Serbian border, is on the point of falling, and the Adriatic port of Dubrovnik is on fire after some of the heaviest attacks on it since it came under siege 43 days ago. ITN's Paul Davis is the only Western television reporter still in Dubrovnik. This evening, a huge cloud of black smoke hangs over the battered walls of Dubrovnik's ancient city after an attack we all feared, but most people secretly believed could never happen. 
this was a deliberate, sustained attempt to inflict irreparable damage on one of the world's oldest and most spectacularly beautiful cities. I watched shell after shell fired at the famous city walls from Federal Navy ships and heavy artillery. Some hit the medieval St. John's Fortress, which is now home to hundreds of war refugees. Two of the city's old towers also took direct hits. Other shells fell in the old harbour, setting fire to small boats. It has not been possible to investigate the extent of damage or assess the casualties. We have been pinned down by sniper fire and mortars falling on and around our hotel, 150 yards from the old city. This hotel is also based to the team of European Community Monitors, a fact that seems to make little difference to the Serbian-led federal forces in their push to capture the city. At one state, we listened with ironic amusement to radio reports that the besieging army had imposed a ceasefire, but the sound of the radio was then drowned by shell after shell exploding around our building. The EC members and myself taking cover on the floor as deadly shrapnel ripped into our walls and through the windows. The observers had hoped to evacuate their team today. There were also plans to take out thousands of women and children. But before that can happen, a ferry skipper has to bring his vessel into the harbour, into the centre of this battle. Paul Davis News at 10 in the besieged city of Dubrovnik. The Foreign Secretary, Mr Hurd, has said Britain is prepared to agree to new powers for the European Parliament to allow a deal on European Union to be done at the Maastricht summit next month. He agreed the concession with fellow foreign ministers at their meeting in Holland. He stressed the powers should be tightly controlled. Such an agreement would enable the Parliament to overrule some decisions of the Council of Ministers. The pace towards Maastricht is quickening, and this time Britain appears to be more in step with her European partners. Meeting in the Dutch seaside resort of Nordvik, ministers have agreed that the European Parliament should have a veto over some legislation. Britain's Douglas Hurd had opposed the idea, but the German Foreign Minister, Mr Genscher, lobbied hard for more powers for the Parliament. This afternoon, the Portuguese confirmed that a compromise was emerging. Some member states want to go much further. Uh, Arch want, wanted to, the status quo to remain. And I think that we have struck a deal which uh, can, can live with, with uh, the 12 of us. The institutions at issue are the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. At the moment, the Council is the main lawmaking body. Most decisions have to be unanimous, but some are passed by what's known as qualified majority voting, where a country's population determines its influence. The European Parliament sits in political groups, not national delegations. It approves the community's budget and can dismiss the Commission, the EC's senior civil servants. On legislation now, it can only express an opinion. The proposal is that in future it will have a veto on those council decisions passed by qualified majority voting. Up till now, the Parliament has been little more than a talking shop. The power of veto would give it some influence over laws affecting the whole community. But the Parliament's president, who addressed the foreign ministers today, says it's still not enough. We are uh, really disappointed with this new text. Uh, it seems that uh, every new uh, draft is a, a step backwards in the process of the political union. But the Dutch hosts of the meeting noted tonight what they called the progress in the attitude of some countries, including that of Britain. So, for the first time, it appears, Britain has agreed that the European Parliament should have some real power over laws devised in Brussels. It's a significant concession which makes a deal at Maastricht more likely. It's also a concession which the British see as a powerful bargaining tool in the run-up to the summit. Libby Wiener, News at 10, Nordvik. Here, divisions within the Conservative Party over Europe will come to a head tomorrow over the chairmanship of the party's backbench European Affairs Committee. The present chairman, Mr Bill Cash, is against any further extension of EC powers. He is being challenged by the former cabinet minister, Sir Norman Fowler, who strongly supports the prime minister's position. Mr Major told MPs again today that Britain would remain at the centre of Europe. It'll all come to a head tomorrow night behind the closed doors of Commons Committee Room 6. Bill Cash, outspoken chairman of the Tory Backbenchers Committee on Europe, will seek re-election on his thus far and no further line on Europe. I am in favour of the European community and I always have been. My concern, in common with Prime Minister and the government, 
and in the House of Commons and the people outside is that we do not want a federal Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, but opposing him will be the former cabinet minister, Sir Norman Fowler, setting out his line on Europe to businessmen and women in Nottingham today. But make no mistake about this also. We have also fought our corner on Europe and we will continue to fight our corner in Europe. We do not accept for a moment a policy of the Commission right or wrong. Now, it's pretty unusual for the likes of Sir Norman, who's already been drafted into John Major's general election strategy team, to be standing for backbench committee office, a point not lost on leading Eurosceptic Norman Tebbit today. I think the backbench committees are best in the party when they're operated under the chairmanship of backbenchers, real backbenchers, not recycled cabinet ministers. And I think it's a very great pity. This contest is going to be seen inevitably as Mr. Fowler standing as, um, as the Prime Minister's man and the Whip's office candidate. Yesterday, Mr. Tebbit made his views on Europe very clear, telling Mr. Major to go no further on the new treaties, as Neil Kinnock was quick to remind the Prime Minister today. What does he say today to those of his right honourable friends who assert that he has gone far enough down the road towards political and monetary union already? And, in the words of his right honourable friends, we should stay where we are. Replying, the Prime Minister said he'd been seeking an agreement to which the House of Commons could agree. There is still some way to go before I could sign the political union treaty that is before us at the moment. There are still matters to be agreed on the monetary union treaty, but in both cases we are now making progress. Normally, the election of officers to a backbench committee would hardly excite any interest at all. But the Tory whips are going around telling their MPs privately that the vote tomorrow is absolutely vital, as they put it. That's because they want the size of the vote tomorrow for Sir Norman Fowler, plus the vote at the end of the forthcoming debate on Europe, to be seen as an indication of the amount of support there is in the party for John Major. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. Police in Kent have charged a man with the attempted murder of the lorry driver who knocked over and killed his 12-year-old son. Stephen Owen will appear in court in Sittingbourne tomorrow. He's charged with attempting to murder Kevin Taylor. Mr Taylor was shot and injured on Saturday, shortly after being released from prison, where he'd been serving an 18-month sentence for running over Mr Owen's son, Darren. At half past seven this morning, Stephen Owen walked into his solicitor's office in Kent and gave himself up. He'd been staying with a relative who'd convinced him there was no alternative. At a press conference, his wife was asked what she first said to him. I love him. He's, obviously, he's very tired, you know, and he's a bit emotionally drained. And, you know, he's, he seems OK in, you know, in his body, but I don't know about his mind at the moment. He just said that he was sorry that he put me through it, and he... He just snapped. We just dealt with each other. We didn't talk much. Stephen Owen's son, Darren, was killed two years ago by hit-and-run driver Kevin Taylor, who's never held a licence and is blind in one eye. He served one year of an 18-month sentence. Stephen Owen went missing immediately after the shooting. His solicitor spoke of the family's ordeal. The family have been through hell in the last two years. Their son has uh, been taken from them in the most tragic circumstance and there's been grief upon grief. The, uh, the, the son was buried in Sittingbourne and his grave has been desecrated. And of his client? Uh, my impression is that the uh, fever has uh, come and gone. It's as if the, the boil has burst and he now wants to put it all behind him and face whatever music there is to face. Stephen Owen will remain here at the police station overnight. He'll appear in court tomorrow morning. Joan Furkettle, News at 10, Sittingbourne. President Bush's honeymoon with the American voter is well and truly over. Opinion polls show him looking vulnerable, especially on domestic issues in next year's election. But Mario Cuomo, seen as the Democrat most likely to beat Bush, appears reluctant to enter the race. Will he, won't he? A report in part two. Plus, the new Cambodia struggles to escape its dark past. And going Dutch, the lean, mean British Airways. That's in a couple of minutes.
poll in the United States suggests that President Bush would have no more support than a Democratic candidate if there was an election tomorrow. It's the first time Mr. Bush's popularity has fallen so low. But the man most Democrats want to run, Governor Mario Cuomo of New York, still hasn't declared. He's keeping America guessing. But if Mario Cuomo decides this week that he wants to be president, he'll become his party's front runner. And unlike the other Democrats who are running, at least America knows who he is. Let's do it together. The governor of a state in severe financial difficulties. An Italian-American Catholic who condones abortion. A national politician who's visited just two countries in nine years. But a man who promises a fight. The economy is a disaster. And he knows his opponent's weak spot. 85% of the American people live in states that are in trouble, raise taxes, cut services, and Washington sits there and says to everybody, everything's great, we won the war, didn't we? Mario Cuomo is by far and away the best public speaker in American politics today. Okay, thank you very much. He's a street fighter. Uh, he grew up in the streets of New York. Uh, he used to box. And he will give George Bush the fight of his life. And the president's on the defensive. A poll today shows him for the first time losing to the Democrats. Your first Democratic senator in 23 years.